at the end of it so, almost feels so obvious. Like it's brilliantly, brilliantly done, uh, brilliantly thought out. Actually, uh, it's a pleasure to read papers like this. At the end of it, okay. almost feels so obvious. Uh, now, guys, can you see my screen also? So we will start with the concept of a manifold. What is a manifold? See, I could give you the mathematical definition of a manifold. A manifold in, let's say that you have a space, uh, you have any n-dimensional surface or hypersurface right? or space. Any, any space, people would in topology call it any space in which locally it looks Cartesian, it looks flat. So does our world look flat locally? Uh, it does, right? For example, um, uh, in this room, the floor is quite literally flat, uh, but you can say, well, the steps are not flat. Yes, that's a discontinuity. But uh, in the middle of the step, it looks locally flat, but then you have a discontinuity. And so, I mean, you do have a, not a discontinuity, but you have a, a sharp bend. It doesn't look, at the edge, it doesn't look flat anymore. But surfaces that locally look flat, how do we bring that concept down? And so there's more to it. You say that, so if we think of a surface of the earth. Everywhere, you can put local patches there. That is one reason because human beings are like ants on earth. For the longest time, everybody was sure that the earth is flat, except that it left the question, what is beyond the edge? Okay. So, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's a testament to human faith that there is a pretty strong community that still be believes that the earth is flat. <laughs> so, if you believe, for example, in philosophy, somebody would say that you have to completely believe what your common sense evidence around you is telling. But if you really look at what your common sense evidence around you is telling, the world is flat. Right? Uh, but still, the world can be uh, ellipsoidal. The earth is ellipsoidal. And so it's a good example of a manifold, rough, roughly an example of a manifold, because locally it looks flat. So now we generalize it to higher dimension. You say, well, not really. They're hills and mountains. So if you smooth out the hills a little bit, so that a tiny little creature everywhere finds it flat, we are looking at a manifold. Right? So in a very rough sense, the surface of the earth is a manifold. Now, imagine a bed sheet. When you, when you are about to, you, you go into a hotel, and the bed sheet is all flat. The sheets are all flat, isn't it? And uh, to an ant and to you, they look flat. Why? Because locally, to ant can only see locally, it's flat. But to you, with bigger vision, also it looks flat. So you say it's flat. But now you get into the sheets, and next morning when you wake up, how does the bed sheet look? Yeah, yeah. yeah. all crumpled up, right? All. Thing. So, but to you, it doesn't look flat, but to an ant, still looks flat. It still flat. Looks flat. So, that bed sheet is a manifold. But what is not a manifold is something in which you tore a hole. Right? Because now there is a discontinuity. Or where, like when you put a crease, when you take a sheet of paper and you fold it and you crease it, now what happens to the edge? The edge doesn't look flat, right? Isn't it? It doesn't look like flat paper sheet. It's literally the edge of the sheet. So therefore, it, that is not a manifold. Those things are usually called, I believe, orbifolds. If they are still continuous, you just created an orbifold. So uh, my way of thinking about manifolds is a somewhat cheesy one, but I think it will serve our purpose. It is exactly that. I'm an ant, and and the manifold is the bed sheet. Right in some higher dimension space. Doesn't have to be in three dimension space and the bedsheet need not be two dimensional. And you realize that the bedsheet is two dimensional, whether it's 
nicely ironed out or whether it is crumpled up. To the ant, it's a local two dimension space. Right. So that is a manifold. Now, if you have been attending my courses, you, you notice that I put a lot of emphasis on the manifold interpretation of machine learning. What I say is that data generally, especially for the purposes of classification and regression, they are always proximal to some manifold. And the job of a, a machine learning model is to discover that manifold, right? The function, a manifold. And remember, there is also a duality between geometry and functions and algebra. Namely, what is geometric? has an algebraic equivalent. What is the equivalent of a curve? Curve is a manifold, isn't it? Locally, it looks flat. What's the equivalent of a curve in the world of algebra? A function, okay? a function of x. Now, generalize it to higher dimension. Uh, so a two-dimensional surface in three dimension is some function, isn't it? In the x, y, z space, some function of this. So a manifold is a function. Now, related back to your machine learning algorithms, what are predictive algorithms? What are supervised learning algorithms? Their job is to find that function which makes the best prediction. The, the function of X is Y hat. Uh, oh, where's my writing tool? Did I walk away with my writing tool? It seems so. Give me a moment, please. Might have left my pen in my office. You see, this is fortunate. Okay. So, so we agree that, I'm oh, sorry, not this. This curve is, this is a manifold. Manifold a 1D manifold, because a curve straightened out is a line, it's a 1D, right? There's only one direction you can move, an ant can move, a so 1D. And this is literally Y is equal to function of X, right? For example, it could be sine of X from the way I drew it. It looks almost like sine of X, Y. Does it make sense, guys? In two dimensional, you, have, you can take, x1, x2, and this is your y hat, y hat. What are you doing? The data, if something is a function, you expect that it is some, something for any given x, for any given point x, which is made up of x1, x2, the coordinates, let's say that some point this p, the coordinates of that point, you agree that up there, there is a Y hat associated with it. You would agree with that? And that Y hat is some function, some vector function of the X vector. Make sense? And now you, this is two dimension and you can generalize now to arbitrary n dimensions. N dimensions. So far so good, guys? Yeah. So let's take the problem of regression. Regression is what? This is, suppose I scatter points here in the first one you realize that y hat is literally the prediction for x, right? How much ice cream did this entrepreneur sell based on the temperature, whatever it is, this is it. Something like that, right? On the other hand, if, we, if you are doing a classification, then for every point of the input space, there is a probability. So what is y hat? y hat then becomes a probability density function. That function is a 
probability density function. In other words, it is bounded between zero and one. Are we together? And uh, with the additional constraint that the y hat, or which is equal to probability of x, yeah, um, if you integrate it over the entire space, entire feature space, let's say that the feature space is p dimension, d x1 xp, what should you get? One. In other words, if you toss a coin, there is 70% probability that it is heads, 30% probability that it is tails, and you add up both the probabilities. What should you get? One. Otherwise, something is off. Take it to the continuous domain. When there are many probabilities, infinite number of possibilities, and each possibility has a finite a probability density, then the integral is nothing but summation, right? Over very tiny bits. So the integral of that probability density has to be one. <laughs> so that's it. But at the end of it, do you, do you see, and this is just a reminder of what I keep saying. So what happens with, with supervised learning, and in particular with classifier is, you're searching for a probability density function at each point, mm -hmm. right? And as you do that, there is something else for a, that is true only for a classifier, which is that you end up discovering a place of equiprobability, right? That is your decision boundary. Remember, we talked about grapes, and let's say that we take the weight of grapes and the size of fruit, size of the fruit, and then you have um, grapes, 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 grapes. They fall like this. Grapes are tiny, except the one in the break room. They seem rather large to me. And uh, let's just take strawberries, right? What color is strawberries? Uh, let's give it a nice strawberry color. Strawberries. Right? And Oh, they, they're beginning to look like strawberries. So whenever you find a probability function, you would agree that there is one particular place where the probability of grape versus strawberry, you're sitting on the fence. That fence sitting on the fence is, that fence is your decision boundary, right? That's a, this is just a review of our basics. And uh, I'm just saying it because I'm building an argument here. This is your decision boundary. So in our way of looking, because we are dealing with continuous functions, your decision boundary in two dimensional is a line or curve. Right? In three dimensions will be a surface and n dimension will be a hypersurface. In other words, it will be a manifold. Would you agree? You, you would agree. Now comes the, now let's take it to our situation and ask, what is this paper trying to say? So now we got the concept of a manifold and we realize decision boundaries themselves are manifolds. Right? Let's take it further now. So decision boundaries are manifolds. Manifolds of n minus one degree, right? So if you're looking in two dimensional space, then the decision boundary has to be a manifold of what degree? One. It, it can only be a curve, some complicated curve, right? So that's what a decision, a decision boundary would be. With that thing, uh, oh, by the way, you know, because I keep saying these things in my courses over and over again, if it looks too easy and repetitive, let me know, we can move faster. Um, but now we come to this paper. It is saying, so look at this paper, what's the date of this paper? And this will give you a historic sense. First of June, 2022, mm -hmm. you realize that much water has flown down the bridge, isn't it? Uh, flown under the bridge. The adversarial attacks were discovered in 2013. 
the last paper we talked about came out in Ian Goodfellows was 2014 in revised version in 2015. That paper was a good contribution. It showed a way to create adversarial examples, which is common sense. But the question is, Ian argued, and it turns out that uh, plausibly, I mean, it would look plausible, but today we, we are not so sure that, oh, our neural networks are too simple. All machine learning algorithms are too simple, even with mutations. So, and maybe the piecewise linearity is a problem, right? Because that is what seemed to him common to all the algorithms. So then came other schools of thought that had all sorts of interpretation. But in the meanwhile, much history, much of history happened. Uh, people became uh, creating adversarial examples became in a, in a small cottage industry. A tribe of people started doing that. Uh, then uh, some startups started coming up uh, or companies started coming up and say, oh, we can help you protect your uh, models against adversarial attacks and see here is a technique and there is a technique, right? And then they, they, they went to conferences, set up booths and Albert Mende. Okay. So they all do that. And uh, now comes an interesting question. Do those defenses actually work? And how are they able to defend, except by some empirical methods? They say, oh, if this is true, so for example, if you have an adversarial example, add it to the training data. Mm -hmm. So make it more robust, that should fix it, right? It, it, but it is in this. It is in this, yeah, exactly. It looks simplistic, but then you can take another, another example, which is neither this adversarial example nor that. And so it poses a very interesting puzzle. It turns out that in the feature space, next to a cat are all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. there, there are dogs and horses and snakes and God knows what all, there are infinite number of them lurking in the vicinity of the cat, isn't it? So any small deviations of our imperceptible deviations from the cat, which human beings can't see, yeah. will make it into a snake or something like that. And you can put the example of the snake image and tell it, no, it's a cat. But then there are infinitely many such points lurking around it. How many examples will you add to the training data? So it's not a, quite a battle that you can win. Do you see that? And that was puzzling people to know, and why was it so? Right? And People initially hope, many hopes, that all the adversarial examples would occupy regions of the feature space. You could cluster or surgically excise them out. Just blacklist those regions of the feature space, right? Or where they're all mixed up, where nothing is clear. Right? So um, that didn't work out. So people have tried many different hypotheses and uh, with different degrees of success. The reason I like this paper quite a bit is because it argues in a way that I find very elegant and a fairly plausible, it's one of the most plausible interpretations of uh, why adversarial attacks are so very easy to create and so very hard to defend against. Right? In fact, it goes on to show that most of, most of the so-called adversarial defenses so far, many of them are, are rather futile. Right? So now, before I go into that, I would like to have, so now that you understand what this is, what a manifold is, can somebody enlighten me? Or what is this paper really trying to say? Defenses. Hmm? Like defense about the defense. Okay. No, it, it goes to the heart of what may be causing adversarial points to lurk around. Basically, making a point that um, trying to explain how these adversarial attacks can happen and points to this wind-filled version of the manifold, which is some sort of a distorted lower dimension version of the manifold. Yeah. Uh, this paper I'll go over carefully, guys. Eh? And because we'll go over carefully and read it, I really want to, because it should train you in really how you should think about machine learning. In, in many ways, or at least the way I like to think about it as a mathematician in terms of geometric and mathematical ideas. So if you have the patience, 
instead of rushing through this paper, I'll go through it slowly. Is that okay? Right? Because clearly you guys haven't gotten it. Uh, it is technical, but actually when I explain it to you, the sheer simplicity and beauty of the idea is quite nice. So we'll read it. Let's start reading this. So question, Asif. Ha, go ahead. That uh, when they tried to, I don't know if um, bound or curb the feature space with different um, um, classes, right? Why didn't that work? You uh, said that, like the cats are close to the dogs and then, then they tried to kind of put them all, like club all of the similar ones together. Why, why didn't it work? I mean, if you okay, create... there is a very simple reason. Oh. The, the spaces are not separable. The set of all points that belong to cat that can be interpreted as cat and the set of all points that are interpreted as dogs are so closely interleaved that between any two points of a cat, you can find infinitely many dogs if you want to. Simply put. Yeah. That's the that's sort of the argument. You'll see why uh, the explanation um, such is in the way that I'll explain to you in a moment. Okay. So let's read this paper carefully. The extreme fragility of deep neural networks. That's a rather damning statement, isn't it? The extreme fragility of deep neural networks. Many people will like suppose I said that about your work. <laughs> the extreme fragility of the code base you have created. <laughs> so the extreme fragility of deep neural networks when presented with tiny perturbations in their input yeah, was independently discovered by several research groups in 2013. It's a fact. Early in 2013, people realized that with tiny perturbations, perturbations means what does perturbation mean? Small, small changes, deltas, delta x's, yeah. epsilon size delta x's. They are very small in the input and put x as the input. Like to this fragility of the neural network doesn't mean that your uh, neural network model itself, I mean, uh, uh, the code doesn't break, the inference is from what it means the inference is very fragile or unstable, like a very small deviations of input leads to vastly uh, different outcomes or predictions. Uh, in, in physics, there's an analogy. Kiosk theory has that. Very small changes in input can lead to vastly different outcomes sometimes. Right? So something nonlinear systems do that. So to me, actually, when I was reading this paper, a lot of that was in the, I was trying to relate to some of those ideas. But okay, here we go. However, Despite enormous effort, these adversarial examples remained a counterintuitive phenomenon with no simple testable explanation. That is true. It, 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 it's been a decade now. We are looking for some right or at least convincing explanation that will address all the issues of explaining why they happen. First, you have to know why they happen. It's somewhat like you're sick, you're running a fever. People have to know what germ the, that you have before they give you an antibiotic. So first comes understanding. So despite tremendous effort, these adversarial examples remain a counterintuitive phenomenon with no simple testable explanation. In this model, we introduce a new conceptual framework for how the decision boundary between classes evolve during training, which we call the dimple manifold. So it says that the, there's something that happens during the training process. See, at the end of the training, you end up with a manifold, a decision boundary. But it is what happens in how the decision boundary is cooked up, is created during iteration after iteration, how it forms. Something happens there. And that is the explanation of why adversarial attacks are so easy. Right. Or adversarial examples are so plentiful. So, so this is the dimple manifold model, they call it. Today, we call it the dimple manifold hypothesis. Right. In particular, because they're making a hypothesis that this is what happens. And they give a fairly uh, plausible arguments to say, uh, this is why it happens. We'll go through that. 
In particular, we demonstrate that training is divided into two phases. The first phase is a typically fast phase, the clinging process, in which the initially randomly oriented decision boundary gets very close to the low dimensional image manifold. So here they speak in terms of images, but we can generalize them. By the way, it don't, doesn't have to be images. But image makes a good case, image manifold, which contains all the training examples. So think your fashion MNIST, MNIST, or something like that, right? Or anything. Next, there is a typically slow dimpling phase, which creates shallow bulges in the decision boundary that moves it to the correct side of the training examples. This framework provides a simple explanation for why adversarial examples exist or why their perturbations have such tiny norms and why they look like random noise rather than like the target class. This explanation is also used to show that a network that was adversarially uh, trained with incorrect label images might not still correctly classify most test cases. And to show that the main effect of adversarial training is just to deepen the ge generated dimples in the decision boundary. That I hope is worrying. And it pretty much puts water on a lot of effort that people have been doing. It, what it is saying, and it is I think right, that training it with adversarial examples, which looks so sensible, right? This guy is calling a, a panda as a gibbon, tell it that it's a cat. It turns out that not only does it not learn from that, it actually makes it worse. It's overfitting. Right? It's some form of overfitting, yes. That is the deepening of dimples. Deepening of dimples. Right? So finally, we discuss and demonstrate the very different properties of on-manifold and off-manifold adversarial perturbations. We describe the results of numerous experiments which strongly support this new model using both low dimensional synthetic data sets and high dimensional natural data sets. So I read this entire abstract because it contained a lot of information. So the mental picture that people have had is that, oh, there's a decision boundary and if from a point you cross the decision boundary, then of course uh, uh, you'll have an adversarial example. Then it would mean that all the adversarial examples are in the vicinity of a decision boundary, isn't it? Because you're not moving too far. If you move too far, the picture will start looking different, isn't it? So let us say that you have these uh, islands, red and blue islands, to go from make a, a red cat look like a blue cat, you would have to go across the decision boundary and some distance. That so, is on manifold and off manifold. Mean? Uh, and on the uh, bed sheet is on manifold, right? A uh, bumblebee flying around is off manifold right? because it is off the surface. It is in the larger space, right? So, or more uh, obviously put, suppose I have line. All points on the line, these are on manifold. on manifold. Whereas X, Y, these are off manifolds. Or PQ, let me use PQ. These are off manifolds. They're not sitting on the, located on the manifold. Are we together? Yeah. And observe one thing. If you're off manifold, there is a perpendicular journey that you can take from some point on manifold to that off manifold point, isn't it? And that is actually part of the crucial argument that they will make. Yeah. And uh, oh, we have almost five o'clock. We have to do the other. Let me do at least finish the introduction, guys, and uh, cover a few sections because this is very interesting. Can you guys please? I know that you haven't understood the paper. Could you give it a second reading before we meet next week? Because it is. These things matter, guys. If these models get, are so easily attackable, it is your ethical obligation to think seriously about protecting it before you unleash it upon the general populace.
So one of the things that, uh, okay, I'll say. In 2013, uh, the, in this paper of Z. Getty, which is the Ian Goodfellow paper, uh, no, actually not, not that paper. So Zeti and Biggio, by the way, these guys are really big you know, in the field, uh, independently demonstrated the surprising fact that even the best trained deep neural networks are extremely fragile when presented with tiny adversarial perturbations. We know now. This discovery naturally attracted a lot of interest and many attempts to explain this phenomenon have been proposed over the last nine years. That DNNs are too nonlinear, that they are too linear, that they were trained with an insufficient number of training examples, that adversarial examples are just the rare cases where DNNs are, that images contain robust and non-robust features. Is there any interpretation that has not been made? Right? So just what variety of explanations are there, right? Um, so you can see what are the things you can say. Either the model is too simple, piecewise linear, or it is too non-linear the two opposite points of view. You could argue that you didn't train it with sufficient amount of data because if you had trained it with sufficient data, what does more data do? It reduces overfitting. It is a regularizer, right? So if you say that this model has overfit and that is the only cause of this problem, then you can hypothesize that let me go and get gazillion images. Let me go and get the Leon data set. What is it? 400 million. Oh, 400 million is like... Uh, uh, yeah, 5 billion. Uh, yeah, 5 billion. Pass it through. <clears throat> right? Maybe then it won't be susceptible to adversarial attack. And yet it is. Right? So uh, insufficient number of training examples doesn't work. The adversarial examples are just rare where DNNs are not true. You can... You can literally open a factory that will infinitely keep producing adversarial examples. That images contain robust and non-robust features, etc. Now you're going into the images that some things are squishy, right? Some features are clear, but some are squishy. And so, well, you know, Panda and Gibbon, they're both mammals. They both have a face, nose, eyes. And some features are not that robust for classification purposes, right? So these are all the explanations that people have given. And robust and non-robust is also a somewhat interpretation of how you interpret what is robust and what is not robust, etc. However, none of these qualitative ideas seem to provide a simple intuitive explanation that can be experimentally tested for adversarial existence. Would you conquer with this statement, guys? Right? So this paper aims not to propose new adversarial attacks or defenses. Right? So not yet another method to attack, nor a method to defend, but an explanation of what really is going on, maybe going on. It's a hypothesis. Right? So this paper, uh, but, but to propose, a new comprehensive framework for thinking about adversarial examples. Numerous papers and talks about this subject use some variant of the highly misleading 2D image on the left side of figure one. So he's saying many papers are using this image as their argument. Why is it misleading? We'll discover. In other words, it is positing a simple explanation on one side are cats, one side are dogs. Just find the shortest journey from cat to dog that will necessarily cross over the decision boundary and cross over a little bit. Something to that effect. Right? And in this mental picture, the square, so it, it is unit square, contains multiple clusters of training images from the two classes denoted by red and blue. So suppose the only thing you have to tell apart are cats and dogs, all red are dogs, all blue are cats. Right? Islands are cats. Training aims to create a 1D curved decision boundary denoted by the gray line that splits the input space into two, not necessarily connected parts. So in this particular case, 
you notice that it has split the space, but at this moment, the two spaces are connected, but in general, it need not be, yeah. right? So, um, that is that. Right? So, its goal is to place each training example on the correct side of the decision boundary and as far as possible from it in order to maximize the confidence level in its provided level subject to the limited expressive power of the given DNA. In this mental image, adversarial examples are created by moving the given image along uh, images along the green arrow towards some kind of centroid of the nearest training examples with the opposite level. Makes sense. Right? You, you take a journey towards the essence of cattiness from God. Right? And cross the training example. Right? So, for example, this is a point that people have made. And oh, it states that Ian Goodfellow has made in a lecture at this particular time. I've not watched that lecture, but I would imagine so. For simplicity, we consider in this paper only two class classifiers for images that are represented at points in n dimension and use L2 norm. L2 norm is what? Euclidean, Euclidean distance. Simply put, we'll just use common sense distance measure, Euclidean <clears throat> distance measure. This input space is split into two complementary, not necessarily connected, and dimensional regions by the curved n minus one dimensional decision boundary. So where did the n minus one come? If you are in n dimensional space, decision boundary has to be n minus one dimension. Mm -hmm. Or in a page, the decision boundary has to be a curve. Yeah, that's it. So, so far so good guys? Yeah. So let's entirely forget about, should we forget about the related work? The new mental image of adversarial examples. The well-known fact which underlies the new conceptual framework is that all the natural images are located on or near some low dimensional manifold. As shown by a huge number of previous papers going all the way back from 1994. What does it mean? See guys, let us say well-known. Did I know that? I claim that you all knew that. How did you know that? You have learned something in the past that would not have existed if this were not true. How do we know that there is a low dimensional manifold on which the images really live? Come again? Yeah, see, there are many, many arguments you can make. For example, you why do autoencoders compress an image from thousand by thousand pixels down to let us say just 10 dimensions or 20 dimensions and still are able to restore the image? Or what does it mean that there is a latent space which is just 10 dimension, which means that this space is somehow in a very warped state in the full high dimensional space, right? Are we together? Just like the surface of that earth is existing in three-dimensional space. Or we say it's three-dimensional, but you realize that you can actually flatten it out. If you take one North Pole out, then you can sort of do a projection into a plane. A plane is two-dimensional, right? So surfaces are, are two-dimensional. So in other words, what it means is and what do autoencoders do? They find the lowest dimensional representation or low dimensional representations of what you have. Okay. So in other words, people have, and people have done experiments by the way, they have seen that when you take images with high pixel dimensions, like you know, thousand by thousand pixel, et cetera, the actual existence of points is not in all those high dimensions. It is actually on a low dimension space. So I'll give you a mental picture that this is coming to. Imagine that you're in a three-dimensional world, right? Things could be floating in the air, or, or just imagine that you're flying in an airplane, right? There are things, the cloud here, cloud there, stars here, moon there, and so on and so forth. But suppose, or, or su suppose you notice, just miraculously, you happen to notice, and it happens to be a fact that these monarch butterflies, when they travel, they occupy a very narrow band of the sky. 
at a certain altitude. So I'm told, huh? I may be wrong, but uh, for the sake of uh, our argument, let us go with maybe imprecise bio, but uh, I'm told that they're up there and you see them as a band. So what happens? They are approximately there, not occupying the entire vertical space from here to there, here to infinity. They are occupying a plane, isn't it? And in fact, a patch of a plane. Yeah. So monarch butterflies are here, migrating. Maybe another community of monarch butterflies somewhere else also migrating as a little band somewhere. Do you see what I'm getting at, guys? Or just look at clouds. Clouds themselves, right? Uh, well, clouds can be pretty thick, so you wouldn't approximate it as just a sheet of clouds. But if you take take a little bit of liberties compared to from the distance from here to the moon, you would agree that all the clouds are nothing sliver. Well, right. depending on the type of the cloud, they are at one level. Like yeah, if sometimes. you look at the cirrus cloud, yeah, they are at all at one level. Exactly. That's good. That's a very good statement that all the cirrus are at one level. So, in a similar way, imagine that in your room. You are searching for where are the kids? Where are the kids? They could be jumping around, they could be sitting, they could be doing, but for whatever reason, you happen to notice that the kids are all sitting on the ground in clusters. Right? There's a, this cluster of friends here, and there's a cluster of friends there. So, in reality, where do the kids exist? They exist on a two dimensional thing, approximate to a two dimensional. Right? They are there. Now what happens? So imagine that in now look at the implications of this. You are in a very high dimension space, right? And it's a very subtle argument. Hidden in that high dimension space is a plane. And your data points are on the plane in a way. Am I making sense? All your images are as little points on the plane. Well, Plane would be an exaggeration, a surface. Imagine that all the uh, uh, images are like little patches on a bed sheet and they are in your room. Now what you're saying is, what is the, what, how do I distinguish between the cat and the dog? The thing is, okay, between the cat and the dog, here's the cat patch and the dog patch. You may put a decision boundary, but there is a third dimension. Right? And what happens in the third dimension? They are neither cats nor dogs, isn't it? But if you create a decision boundary like this, they will, it will rise up as a wall, sort of. <laughs> and that is a crucial observation that they'll make. Um, and so, I suppose I'm getting ahead of it. Um, but okay, so now I'll ask you a question. Can you create lots of examples that are neither cats nor dogs? What happens if I take a cat and don't stay on the manifold, go off manifold, perpendicular to the manifold. If I go perpendicular to the manifold, how many points perpendicular to that manifold and therefore a cat going at, on top of a cat sitting? So in other words, it's like a totem pole, right? How many things can I put on top of that? On top of a cat, off axis, or off manifold, along the perpendicular direction. Infinitely, Infinitely many. And would you agree that none of those points are actually cats or dogs? Yes, yes. And yet, a decision boundary necessarily will classify it as something. Isn't but why it? are they not cats then? Like because all the cats are on the bed sheet. So, yeah. What is up there? So, Asif, is, is that right? That basically we put a decision boundary based on some of the training data that we got. Yes. We said if everything is on the left, it's a cat. Everything is on the right, that's a dog. But you're saying right and left on the bed sheet. I, exactly. On the bed I mean, sheet. No, I'm saying in, in terms of the decision boundary. Let's yeah. say whatever is the decision boundary, like the wall that you're talking about. Yeah. Everything on the left of the wall is a cat in a 3D space. Yeah. Is a cat on the right is a dog. Yeah. But we never talked, we never told these guys about a lot of these things. Could be anything. Right? The, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. The main point is that, so we'll go step by step, but observe the fact that 
whenever you train with data, meaningful data always lives in a lower dimensional submanifold. See, this is a thing I've been saying since ML 100, isn't it? Always do, not just for images. Data will always be proximal to a lower dimensional manifold. Okay? Otherwise, it will be meaningless. I'll give you an example. Let's see, guys, take, take the example of regression. Okay? If I have a relationship between, sorry, um, between X and Y like this, and it may be a complicated curve, Do you think there's a relationship between uh, X and Y? Is there a relationship? You would look at it and say, yes, nonlinear, but there is a relationship. What does it mean geometrically? Geometrically, it means that there is a embedded submanifold that data is proximal to, to the first approximation is sitting on it, isn't it? On the other hand, if I give you this situation, oh, sorry. and ask you, now, what's the relationship between X and Y? Would you, would you have any confidence that there's a relationship? No. no. Isn't it? And look at the data. Is it sitting on a submanifold? Yes. No, 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 no. No, it's occupying the whole space. Isn't it? It's cat is just diffused. Isn't it? So what does it mean when when there is really a relationship, what is a relationship? When you say I can predict y from x, it means that y is some function of x. It means it is, that it is, it is a manifold. It's a manifold, and it's, it's an a manifold. And therefore, by definition, and in obviously mathematically, what it means is all the data points are proximal to a hidden submanifold. Your job is to just go discover it, isn't it? So all of machine learning is a process of discovering that. Submanifold. Am I making sense now? Yeah. Right? And the moment you have a submanifold, an embedding manifold, you have to know that there are always perpendicular directions where there are points that are not on the manifold. I can go take, take this point, oh, fly off into space, and what do you call this guy? P. Off. off manifold point. You get that, right? And so one of the arguments that it will make is that that's a fertile ground for adversarial data, yeah. uh, why and how, and we, there's much more to it. This paper is very nuanced, guys, it's very well argued, and I love it, uh, but uh, we are way past our time. How about I stop at this point? I've given you enough geometric intuition, guys. Can you please try to read this paper? Yeah, uh, hang on, uh, go ahead, Albert. So the, it has to be part of the function, right? If it's not a part of the function, then it's an ad adversarial mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, it's basically you're giving it a point that doesn't make sense. Right. So, um, uh, so one more thing, but before I, I won't, I will explain these things in detail, but uh, at this moment, take it as a fact that what happens is that, let me give you a very high level understanding. When you're training the thing, manif the example, this, what happens is, suppose there are two problems are done on the bed sheet. Imagine you have a patch for cats, you have a patch for dogs, and it's a curved bed sheet. You have to discover the bed sheet. Now imagine those cat patches hanging in the air, dog patches hanging in the air, and you know that they are on a bed sheet because that's a, otherwise they wouldn't be, it would, just wouldn't make sense, right? So the, you have two problems. You have to first find that embedding manifold on which the data sits and then go and build a decision boundary on it. So right. that is the critical part, right? How do you figure out that some manifold on which the data exists? Exactly. How do you, uh, that is the point. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So he, here is how we would go about it. Let's say that a uh, very simple example. Let us say that uh, I take like in three dimensional space, I want to draw a decision boundary. The decision boundary can be uh, what can it be? Uh, it's a sheet. It's a, something. It, it tells that this area is cold, this area is hot, or something like that. And there are examples all over. First thing is it's a flat sheet. 
So you can start with a random plane somewhere. Imagine a, a foil, a metal foil, metal sheet somewhere, flexible metal sheet. It's your plane. It's a linear decision boundary. So the first thing you need to do is bring it close to your data. Isn't it? That would be your step one, right? First, bring the that thing close to your data so that it even makes sense. They, you randomly started there. You need to bring it close to where your cats and dogs are sitting there in the feature space. That part makes sense. But now here is an example. Here's a, a crucial, uh, a tricky part. You have the foil and you need to now tilt it gradually and bend it in such a way push it below, let's say that uh, you want to say po the, the points above are cats, the points below are dogs, because this is your decision boundary on one side has to be cats and dogs. So what you have to do, you have to now decide what parts of that you need to push below mm -hmm. the dogs. So now comes the slow part of pushing it. Once you have brought it close to the data, which you can do pretty fast, which they're calling the fast phase. Then comes the argument is, and this is where I'm like, it's a very plausible and beautiful argument. I'm not 100% sure it works, but it's an argument. Let's see the decision boundary, the neural network structure is, it has to make small changes, right? And in small changes, it has to sort of step-by-step -step cross over, right? And the, bend the sheet of metal to now have the, this red point above it, this red point above it, right? But this, that's what we're building, no? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the learning thing. The trouble is, right? In a way, it's overfitting. You have enough data. You have this cluster. But the point is, even if you had lots of data like this, you would still have that because you are forced to dimple the manifold. The moment you dimple the manifold, it leaves potential. It leaves potential for you to create adversarial examples, isn't it? Because the when you when it learns, think about it this way. Here, here are the cats and you bent it like this, the manifold. It will bend only enough, it will learn only enough, such that its loss function decreases. But what it won't do is tilt it like this completely. It will learn like this, isn't it? And the images are here. That is all that is practically needed because you're training it with real cats and dog images. They're here. It serves its purpose. And what they're saying is adversarial examples are through this, right? Yeah. Just go off the uh, perpendicular, off manifold, and now you can have plenty of adversarial sort of uh, thing. So, of the more the number of dimples, uh, the, greater the, the yeah. chances. The greater the chances, because see, uh, the more dimples also mean that it is pretty close to, and in some sense, like Satyam, see the, the, the general, feeling that Satyam is quantum intuition is correct. That it sort of looks as though it's a form of overfitting, except that it is hard to regularize. It is baked into the structure of the neural network. Yeah. The way it is trained, that you there is no very clear way out of it, right? So once you bend it down, the network will stop. And so the, the whole thing is, uh, it opens up the possibility of two things. One is adversarial attack by creating points off manifold, but on manifold also, because at this point, the data, data on the data plane itself, they will be because it's a non-linear thing. The ordinary, so those ones are easy to understand. You know, just cross over uh, the decision boundary on the image plane itself. And you, but if you do that, then it might begin to the dog might begin to look rather cattish. You, know? you have to be careful. But when you go off diagonal, you know, off manifold, you you realize you have no danger of looking like a dog. You're a cat, you're going perpendicular to a cat. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so anyway, this is a well-argued paper, guys. How about we take it up that's later? Why decided, that's why they said that if you have the small, very small perturbation, that's when it gets confused. Yeah. If you have a bigger perturbation, it will be easy to understand. Yeah, right? for, for on plane, for on manifold perturbations, large perturbations will be observed. But uh, the point here is that off manifold perturbations, Perpendicular, you can go as far as you want. Yeah. So, so anyway, the points that I want to do and close this with are the explanations of the counterintuitive property of adversarial examples. Section five, I will do, guys, and I'll conclude with that. Right? 
the biggest difference between the two mental images is how we think about adversarial examples. In the old mental image, adversarial examples were created by going horizontally towards the nearest training examples with the opposite label, isn't it? So in the new language, you would say that is the on manifold movement from one cluster to another cluster, right? Yeah, the cat group to the dog group images. And uh, which are all very far away. It was the nearest training example to the opposite labels, which are all very far away. In the new mental image, adversarial examples are creating by going vertically a tiny distance towards the dimple decision boundary and then continuing another epsilon on the other side. Because your decision boundary is dimpled. See, if you're, uh, hang on, where is my? See, look at this point, guys. The old picture would say, go like this. Do you see where I'm writing on the picture? Figure two, go like this. Cross the decision boundary a little bit, right? Maybe the human being will still see a uh, cat, but you know it's a dog. But actually, when you try that, it will look rather doggish, right? Uh, on the other hand, in this picture, think about it this way, guys. What happens? If you go in this direction, vertically up, you're going perpendicular to the plane of the data. When you go this way, you cross the manifold. You get to a point that looks very, so let's say that the reds are, or reds are cats or dog, I forgot. What did we call the reds? Cats. cats. So cats, it, it has no danger of looking like a dog, isn't it? In fact, or, or take this example. Uh, anyway, I'll go a little bit far off from this. Along this line, keep moving up. You'll cross the decision boundary, and after that, you have infinitely many adversarial examples to choose from, isn't it? Do you see the point? That, that's here. Okay. So, in the new mental image, adversarial examples are created by going vertically a tiny distance epsilon towards a dimple decision boundary and then continuing epsilon distance on the other side. Once you cross over, lovely, right? This model provides the following simple explanations. First question is, why are there adversarial examples at all? How can it be that next to any cat image, there, there's also an image of a guacamole and vice versa, right? The answer is that all the real cats and guacamole images reside on a tiny image manifold. You know, there's a very low dimensional bed sheet onto which they're cl clinging. But there is not just in three dimensions, there's just only one more axis, right? Perpendicular. But in thousand dimensional spaces, there are thousands of perpendiculars to that bed sheet. In all of those directions, you can go. Right? The answer to that is that the real cats and guacamole reside on the tiny image manifold. However, below and above the manifold, there are vast half spaces of pseudo cats and pseudo images recognized by the network as cats and guacamole, even though they, they do not look like one, isn't it? They would have looked like it if it would have been on the manifold, data manifold, right? But they are off there. You are creating something that in real life you wouldn't see. Am I making sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's where, so the manifold was created on the basis of the training data, right? The initial part of the paper says that if you have, if you do have more training data, you're still not going to be able to solve it. You won't be able to solve it. Because, like, I mean, if you had a lot more cats or dogs, like, wouldn't your manifold be more accurate? No. So look at this picture. I can go on creating lots of dogs and cats and cats and cats and cats and cats. And cats. The line will still, the manifold will still, still yeah, okay. you have to come up with some manifold. Yes, exactly. So it speaks to the complexity of the data itself and how it resides on the manifold uh, than any peculiar, uh, than. It's also probability, right? I mean, no matter what model you kind of come up with, you'll never be 100% right. Oh, yeah, yeah, that is that. No, having said that, uh, with see, in many situations, huh, um, the models have fairly like for example let's say that you try to distinguish between a grape and a strawberry example that i say weight and size are the examples 
there is almost no adversarial attack you can create because every grape has a weight, every grape has a size, right? So they fill the manifold, they fill the page. Any point you take will be a legitimate grape or strawberry, isn't it? Now, it may be an impossible strawberry, like a hundred pound strawberry, but out there still, you, it's not an adversarial example because it will be classified as that. So the problem has to do with the fact that data is not residing on a sub-manifold. It's residing on the whole manifold, the whole sheet. And decision boundary can be fought. But, but, but didn't you cover us if in this, the, the clinging phase and the dimple creation? The dimple yes. creation is the manifold uh, thing, right? Like when you get better and better at it, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you get better and better at it. But remember, it gets better and better on what? It is learning from, its job is during training. See, imagine that you're on a plate, on the bed sheet, right? On the bed sheet, the neural network will learn to make the most beautiful and correct decision boundary between the uh, cat images and the dog dogs, right? Because all the cats and dogs are patches on the bed sheet. Correct. Yes, right? But what it is not learning and has no clue about is that what to do with the points that are no. off manifold. Right? Right. Because they inherently don't exist. They only exist in the world, world of adversarial examples. So, but the dimple starts to form only when you give a larger training set, right? That's that's when they start to create it, right? That's no, what... no, no, no. With sufficient, let's see, dimples speak to the complexity of the patches being spread out here and there. No? I thought I read it the different way. Like, that's why I was questioning what Satyam was saying. He said that you give more training examples, right? If you go a little bit above. No, no, okay. So, Sachin, uh, I will uh, go there. Um, let yes. me draw, bring yes. a few pictures. I, I want to illustrate it. This is the, this is the paragraph of all that. Uh, about. Thinking about? Thinking about? Yes, yeah, there. Thinking about the decision boundary as a thin sheet of pliable metals. A little bit above. Go a little bit above. Okay. Which paragraph? Yes. Section what and which paragraph? Yes. This, this one? Yeah. One and two, the one above that, right? Oh, training a DNN. Okay, so we recall this conceptual framework and note that it is based on two testable hypotheses uh, about how decision boundaries evolve during the training process. Training a DNN processes in two distinct phases, the typically fast clinging process. See, what is the clinging process? Data is sitting here. Get you are making a manifold here. So very quickly, it will come at least proximal to the data, right? That part should be an uh, easy fly because that's just straight gradients and no, no obstruction. Right? We did it a different way though, right? Like you, you normalize the data. Remember you used to talk about like bring the cross X, Y right in the middle of the data. So no, no, you assume the data is all normalized. So imagine that this is all in a unit queue. It's right? still. A typically fast clinging phase, which brings the decision boundary very close to the image map, right? So followed by a typically slow dimpling phase, which creates shallow dimples in the decision boundary that try to move the boundary to the correct side of the training. Right? So the why shallow uh, this thing? Because, it, you know, learning, deep learning will minimize the loss. Imagine that, suppose I have a red point here. Uh, no, well, this doesn't look like red. Let me take a red. Suppose there is a, uh, well, in this case, they bring red or blue above. I keep forgetting. Where is that picture? Oh, uh, red is below, blue is up. Uh, okay, let, let me just take this mental picture. Hey, red is here. Oh my God, this is trouble. But okay, we'll go with that. Huh? And then I must have a blueberry or something like that. Great. So, let's say that the grape is here. And you're trying to, uh, initially, you're trying to create this. Initially, just imagine that you created a, in, in the beginning, you came to this. Quickly, you came to this surface. And then what you try to do is, you try to bend it, uh, this, isn't it? You realize that after you have bent it to this dimple, the machine learning algorithm has no reason to go like this. Make a deep dimple. Correct. Yeah. There's no reason to, because data just doesn't, meaningful data just doesn't exist there. 
it is empty space. So, then to your argument, if I have a Gauss manifold point and I train the model to say that that is a uh, adversarial data, wouldn't that help? Because no, no, it, it makes it worse. So I'll tell you how. So why? Right. So what happens is that currently you take a point like this, uh, this point, let me just take uh, this yeah. point. Yeah. And uh, you take a point like this, which it's obviously looks point. like a grape, but this to the to this decision boundary, but you tell it, no, 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 it's a strawberry. No, I'm telling the inverse. Response, if this green line is your manifold mm -hmm. and uh, decision boundary, then I'm saying anything that is beyond it. Is oh, that is off manifold. Off manifold. I'm saying off yeah. manifold. Anything yeah, yeah, off yeah. manifold is a uh, adversarial. No, no. Point. So I'll tell you. No, no. Your, your intuition is right. How far off? <coughs> Points never sit on the manifold. They're proximal to it. Otherwise, it will be overfitting. Yeah. They, you, know, you have to remember that these manifolds are the mathematical constructs. They are infinitely thin. So this a thin metal sheet is infinitely thin. So by definition, every point is proximal to this decision boundary, thin metal sheet. But when you say off manifold, how far is it to qualify it? What is the qualification of an off manifold? Yes. So the qualification of the off manifold is, let's say, I'll give you an example. Like here you are there, right? Yep. You go from this point towards the manifold and just any point that crosses the manifold is off. Is, is an adversarial example. And now the risk is if you go too far, God knows it might not even look like a strawberry. So you don't want to go yeah, too far. It even visually might not look like a... That is right, and that is sort of the main idea that these people are. No, but it's the other one. If you go too far, see, if you look at this green line or whatever, if you look at this green line in the manifold as a classifier, right, you have to classify as a strawberry or a grape, right? So anything on this side of the green line is a grape. It, it may be off manifold, it could be very further out, but it is that green manifold. Is saying everything on this side is a strawberry, everything on that side is a grape. I thought the whole no, no, no. Of so one way off manifold means it's adversarial. Yeah, yeah. It sort of gets. See, the whole idea is that think Not about manifold. it. So, guys, this is, here is a sheet. Just imagine it's flat, like in this paper here. They show you. There are patches of red and blue, cats and dogs, right? So you bring a manifold. It will be. It will stay very proximal to your mm -hmm. to your data manifold. Decision boundary is its own manifold, but it will stay proximal to it, right? And what will happen is, so that it will dimple out because it will just, in necessary areas, it will flip over. Mm -hmm. Now, so far, so good. Now comes the question, can we create adversarial examples? Yeah. From any point, just go in the direction of the decision boundary and cross it a little bit. Now, the question that you are asking is, so we'll come to the defense part later, guys. I know that you guys are getting a lot of ideas on defense. Hold on to that. Uh, but you realize that the reason, in a way, the core reason is that there is a perpendicular. In fact, there's so many perpendicular directions to go, right? Whereas in when I made this simple example of actual, you know, data like weights of a, a gra grapes and uh, grapes and strawberries, there is no other direction to go. But you can go. You can't create an adversarial yeah, example. Yeah, Anything nope. above the boundary. Still, a certain distance is acceptable because you're not sitting flat on the decision boundary. But beyond that, is that whichever direction? You... No, but I'll I'll just point out. Look at the middle picture where, the, where you have a bunch of blues and reds. Yeah. yeah. What is a manifold that will separate out the blues and the reds? Yeah, it is the. See, you look. So, okay, let me explain this picture, guys. So, what he's saying is, and by the way, this is a deliberately hard constructed thing. They did it for a reason. So you see that this is a this is literally looks like the salt lattice. But is is it uh, right, as if that the manifold through those reds and blues, which can classify red or blue, is going to be incredibly hard? Yeah, yeah, it is deliberately a hard problem, I say. So you agree that the data where is that? So okay, guys, let's get it clear. Where is the data manifold? It is literally the plane, yeah. the plane of this lattice. Yeah. 
this lattice plane is your data manifold. Yes. So now you realize, so intuitively you ask yourself, if in a high dimensional space, data is clinging to this plane, then that's the first observation to make, which means there is a lot of space, which is nonsense. Yes. Yeah. And much of the risk comes from there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They are arguing that that is because the, the nature of the deep learning is such that it becomes a risk. So that's what I'm trying to argue. No, no, hold on. I, I got your argument. Just hold on to that. What you're saying is sufficiently far from this manifold, right? You will. But then that puts an interesting constraint. See, we don't explicitly compute the decision boundary in a closed format. You don't. If you knew that closed form equation, you could do that. But what you instead have is this very complicated neural net which is, you trust it is this function and this lovely decision boundary, but you never ask it in closed form. You just say that, okay, you know your decision boundary, tell me your prediction. That's what you do. Yeah. If we knew that function, absolutely right. We could then therefore have a notion of distance from the decision boundary, right? But we don't have that function accessible. The other observation also is that, as they are saying, that given this is a very simplistic example of a red and blue, mm -hmm. you know, on one side, we're looking at avocados and cats and dogs and whatever. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a visual model, which has been trained on infinite number of things. Yeah. The way I understand is that the manifold itself is... Oh, no, no, you can never train on infinite classes. Fine. No, no. If I give classifier, them, if classifier, I, you have to explicitly state that finite possibilities so if i look at like a if i look at like a lava yeah and i say describe this image oh that it will do it can be generated it. You know, because it's a generative model it's not a discriminative model this is a discriminative model a discriminative means it's classifying the same and classifying is from a already declared set of possibilities so in other words you have to say probability of a cat probability of a dog and probability of a horse let's say they add up to, they must add up to one. Always. Right? There has to be closure. Now I'm confused, case. like, what exactly is this we were talking about? Because <laughs> for the classifiers that you have? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. This, is, this, this, we, this paper completely focuses on the image classifier. Classifier. Classification. Right? It, because it's a hard problem. And it's also intuitive to get. So, guys, what are they saying? So, we know. So, guys, remember. In this simplistic example, data plane is flat. Data manifold is flat. True, looks flat to you, right? This flat, in fact, it looks horizontal plane on which the data is sitting. Is it occupying a sub-manifold of the entire space? The entire space is three-dimensional. It is in a sub-manifold. So this begins to, so this is its parallel to the real world. Images are sitting on a sub-manifold. And then you start to bring a decision boundary. So what would you do? You take a bed sheet, first you wrap, throw it all over the points. So it comes very fast phase. Now, there it is. But there's a problem. But one side is supposed to be red, one side is supposed to be blue. So what do you need to do? This bed sheet is sort of, uh, what is it? It's like a knitting, netting, right? So you can sort of push it down so that the uh, red points stay up and the blue points, oh no, red points stay up and the blue points stay down or something like that. So how will the blue points stay down? And in those areas, you pull the sheet up so the blue points will stay down. And red areas, you push the sheet down so that because the points are in a plane. So to keep the red points up, you'll have to push the sheet down. And to keep the blue points up uh, down, you have to pull the sheet up. So you will end up with a dimple sheet. Do you see that intuition? And what they're saying is, because you have that happening, it's a hypothesis. Remember, guys, these are not completely bulletproof arguments. These are hypotheses. It's a, mental, it's a model of what is happening. And therefore, you see that much mischief comes from the off-manifold off direction. Right? So any like off-manifold direction when I go, now you realize that there is a, the thing. So we will discuss it in more detail, guys, huh, later on. But let me finish this section five. I wanted to these four or five points so that four points that it stays there. So uh, now, guys, with this mental image, let's go back and say, oh, 
the answer is that all the real cats, cats and guacamole images reside on a tiny image manifold, namely, in the case of blue and red points on the plane. However, below and above the manifold, there are vast half spaces of pseudo images, yeah. things that are basically nonsense spaces. Yeah. Recognized by the networks as cats and guacamole, even though they do not look like one. The point is a decision boundary has a job. It partitions the space into two halves, isn't it? It will call one half cat, one half dog, right? Whether you like it or not, whether it's nonsense or not. So given a nonsensical point, it says, well, you know what? It's a cat. You got it, right? That's it. So that's the one point is making. Uh, the adversarial examples we generate are, are such pseudo images. But note that when we consider multi class classifier in an n dimensional input space, they have multiple n minus one dimension decision. So that we can do pairwise, forget about it. Uh, second point why are the adversarial examples so close to the original images? So this question comes right? adversarial exam, when you look at the panda, panda, and the gibbon, Right? Panda that was misclassified as given. They look so close. The amount of noise you introduced was so minuscule, so utterly tiny. Right? Why? And it was hard to explain why that little perturbations could cause such vast outcomes. As explained above, DNNs prefer to have large perpendicular derivatives in order to have shallower dimples. So what, what happens is, Look at this point, guys. At this point, at this point, th this is a point of high curvature. In fact, a related hypothesis is high curvature hypothesis. You agree, right? Mm -hmm. To have shallow dimples, right? It will have high perpendicular derivatives, right? It's, it's, yeah. We'll have large perpendicular derivatives in order to have shallow dimples that make it easy to undulate the decision boundary and the training examples generally. The tiny distance is a direct consequence of this large gradient since it suffices to move a short distance to significantly affect the confidence level. Okay. So if in the vicinity of the decision boundary, the gradient of the loss is high, right? So to change your answer, Change, make a big change in your probability of your answer. You need to go really a tiny, if this is big, then you need to take pretty small steps, right? The tiny di di distance is a direct consequence of this large gradient since it suffices to, and this is as simple as this, right? you know, uh, this is referring to this. Right. This we encountered in the last paper, remember, this is the loss gradient. Mm -hmm. Why don't the adversarial perturbations resemble the target classes? This is, this used to be a question, right? Mm -hmm. Those adversarial examples, why don't they resemble the target? When we use an adversarial attack to modify a cat into a guacamole, why doesn't the perturbations we use look green and mushy? Most adversarial perturbations look like featureless small magnitude random noise. We saw that, right, in the first paper, random noise. In the new mental image, we are moving roughly perpendicular to the direction of the guacamole image. Right? So uh, can I use dog instead of guacamole? We are moving perpendicular to the dog image. Right? For example, if a unit vector towards the nearest guacamole image is this, then a random unit vector perpendicular to it is, like if a vector is going like this, sorry, is going like this, right? Then you, you realize that in a three dimensional space, there are infinitely many vectors will go perpendicular to that vector, right? And which each is a tiny positive or negative value around this, but given such an adversarial perturbation looks like the random salt and pepper perturbations we see in the standard demonstration. So those perturbations will not have structure. They are small random perturbations, salt and pepper things. Right? So it makes sense. It has been experimentally demonstrated that more robust networks tend to be less accurate. Right? Uh, uh, why do robust and uh, why do robustness and accuracy trade off? Things that are robust to adversarial attack, they tend to be less accurate. In the new model, each of the training and the 
and the existence of nearby adversarial examples are two sides of the same coin. When we train a network, we keep the images stationary and move the decision boundaries around them by creating difference. Right? That's the thing, right? When we create adversarial examples, right? We keep the decision boundary fixed because you know the model is frozen, right? And move the images to its to, to its other side, allowing a large perpendicular derivative makes the training easier since we do not have to bend the decision boundary around the training example sharply. Right. So what it basically means is you want to make, you don't want to, you like, suppose you have a point here. You don't want to bend your decision boundary like this. In fact, that would be overfitting. Right. You don't want to make such uh, weird things. You want to have a nice shallow, like this, dimple, minimum dimple like this. So that also, uh, yeah, uh, where, where am I? In, um, it has been, in the new, why do, yeah, okay. When we train a network, we keep the images stationary and move the decision boundaries around them by creating dimples. When we create, I would say, by allowing a large perpendicular derivative makes the training easier since we do not have to bend the decision boundary around the training example sharply. However, such a large derivative also creates a very, close adversarial example, isn't it? So see, a gradient of the loss, when it is good, helps you learn better. But once you have learned, the trouble is, it, it also helps the adversary learn faster, right? So that remains a fact. Because see what is happening, to learn, you're moving the decision boundary for adversary, you're keeping the decision boundary similar, but you're again doing the gradient of the loss, but with respect to data, see, here's the thing. In learning, you do a gradient with respect to the weights, isn't it? Yeah, or you can say theta with respect of the losses with respect to the parameters, you're changing the parameters, you're changing the, moving the decision boundary. In adversarial attack, you are instead doing this, right? That's pretty much what they're saying now. Um, Doesn't look like a fixable problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, see, it needs, first of all, there's the thing, is this hypothesis true, right? Um, they make fairly strong our plausibility arguments. It's one of the leading candidates at this moment, I would say, right? But the strong curvature hypothesis is the other one, the, big, uh, the sharp curvature hypothesis, which is quite related and similar argument. Uh, and other point that it makes is adversarial training just deepens the dimples. What will happen? See, think about it this way, guys. Suppose you give it a point here and remind it because it came from a dog and it still to human eye looks like a dog. You tell it it's a dog. All that will happen is the new decision boundary will now Have more go like this. <laughs> it will just sharpen the dimples. Deepen the dimples, isn't it? Common sense, right? That is it. That's what they're saying. So, uh, uh, so I'll let you guys read the paper. It's a beautiful paper. Read the rest of it, guys. It's worth reading yeah? because it's a serious problem with neural nets and people are trying to understand it. Go is, is there a paper that talks about how to avoid this? There is a paper. There, that there, yeah, of course. There I shared it in the resources. Right? The very next slide is that. It's a survey paper. Where is that? Yeah. In the very next, yeah, the uh, the, yeah, the, the next one, and, yeah. Also, this one. Uh, does underfitting lead to this? See, underfitting leads to robust models, but they generally don't help you with that. Then the prediction is probably yeah, yeah, but it will help in this. So you can have it robust, no, you but have inaccurate. Yeah, yes, that will be robust. But accuracy but, goes for a toss. Yeah, I mean, it's a double edged sword. Yes. Yeah. No, but also the thing is, even if it is robust, it'll have lesser dimples, but you can still attack it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can, it'll have you some can dimples. That is the hypothesis. Yeah. 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 So any dimples, you can get attacked. But yeah, see, guys, what they are saying is the problem is that data occupies a very limited subspace yes. of embedding submanifold <coughs> that leaves a lot of dimensions for mischief. I like Unless it's very dense, right? 
What about a very dense network? Yeah, yeah, sort of. But images inherently have this yeah. problem, right? They're pixel dimensions, right? Or is raw data? I'll come to you. Uh, image image so see, it's thousand by thousand pixels is a million dimensions. Yeah. Right? And from there, you're trying to reduce. You know that a cat doesn't need a million dimensions to be expressed. Right. right? Yeah, uh, perhaps I'm not at some of uh, the sale of the differences. Yeah. There's one the thing that they talk about that I found interesting was null label. <laughs> they, uh, at first, the only thing that makes sense to me mm -hmm. of all the other limitations that they can have, they're saying if you can do sales, they're saying that it's a different address to the examples to transform from one network to another, just make it null. If you don't know if it's X or Y, just make it null. So, yeah. That was the only it? one that makes sense because the other ones all had some other. Actually, it has a weakness because null just introduces a curve. If it's not a cat or a dog, it's something else. So it becomes a three binary classifiers dog or null, cat or null, dog or cat. Right. And ultimately, a decision boundary will be a composite of this. So what basically, right? I don't, I don't think it will quite solve it. It will no, make it better. Any of the regulations that they have given, they have given them like the distillation or you know features using or any of the defense. Yeah. None of them make sense. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Distillation is the approach that makes sense. In other words, let's take a more robust, simpler model. Yeah. Right. But that's not going to solve it because it will become more yeah. and so on. Yeah, so guys, here's the thing. When you think of problems from a mathematical perspective, do you realize that you gain the power to see what will and will not work yeah. in some sense? Right? Now, I don't know whether this hypothesis is true. It was a very intriguing paper, and I thought I'll introduce you it guys. It looks very logical. It looks very logical. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Right. All right, guys, so that ends the paper reading section for today. And now, uh, first is uh, Mosni Banerjee is going to talk about uh, mm -hmm. on this topic. And then Satyam is going to do his demo. And then we'll have the Cambrian. Patrick, you're ready with your Cambrian? Or next time? Next time. Next time. Next time. Next time. Next time. OK, so we'll have Mosmi and uh, Satyam. Oh, no, I was oh, People will forget. We are moving past this topic. So talk about it. I'll stop the stream. Or you want to talk here? Oh, I have a few notes that I can have taken that I can talk. OK, why don't you talk about it? Uh, come here so everybody can hear.